Hello, class. Welcome to another edition of Superhero Seminary. I'm your professor. You can call me Steve, or you can call me Professor Captain, but that's a bit awkward, so just go with Steve. I want to talk to you today about something that's near and dear to my heart. My superhero name, as you well know, is Captain America. So you would think that I'm all things American. And that brings us to the subject today that I want to talk about, which is nationalism and patriotism. You see, there's a very big difference between nationalism and patriotism. The former is an idolatrous sin. The latter is a virtue that is to be celebrated. And I want to look at that difference today because a lot of people are confused about what is nationalist and what is patriotic. And a lot of nationalists think they're just being patriots, not realizing that they've succumbed to an ideology that's totally at odds with the gospel of Jesus Christ. So buckle up and get ready, true believers. In his book, The Four Loves, C.S. Lewis talked about the difference between good patriotism and patriotism that leads into evil nationalism. He said, love of home, love of place we grew up in, or the places perhaps many which have been our homes, and of all the places fairly near these and fairly like them, love of old acquaintances, of familiar sights, sounds, and smells. Of course, patriotism of this kind is not in the least aggressive. It asks only to be let alone. It becomes militant only to protect what it loves. In any mind which has a pennyworth of imagination, it produces a good attitude towards foreigners." How can I love my home without coming to realize that other men, no less rightly, love theirs? This is good patriotism, according to Lewis. But Lewis noted that there's a deviant, evil form of patriotism, which he says is, quote, not a sentiment, but a belief, a firm belief, even prosaic belief, that our own nation, in sober fact, has long been and still is markedly superior to all others. And he goes on to talk about this attitude, which is nationalism, that our country is not just one we love, But our country is superior to others, is better than others. And therefore, he goes on to reason, if our country's cause is the cause of God, wars must be wars of annihilation. A false transcendence is given to things which are very much of this world. And that's what nationalism is. It's a false transcendence. It's a giving of idolatrous allegiance to one's country, which is very much temporary. Countries come and go. Nationalities come and go. Borders shift and change. Citizenship shifts and changes. These things are all temporary. They have no place in the kingdom of God other than the patriotic view, which is simply love of the things one loves because of the goodness in them, without views of superiority over others. In a recent post in Christianity Today, flagship evangelical publication in America, editor Mark Galley made a comment about nationalism versus patriotism, and particularly Christian nationalism. He says, Let us be clear. To believe that members of other religions are to be feared instead of loved, and yes, sensitively evangelized, that is a denial of the power of God. To believe that we should secure borders at the expense of welcoming the sojourner, that is immoral. To believe that America is a divinely chosen nation, to be privileged at the expense of other nations, that is idolatry. And to the degree that any Christian subscribes to such beliefs, to that degree is the Christian called to repent and believe in the gospel. You see, a lot of Christians have equated my symbol, America, the country that I was created to serve and to protect and uphold during our darkest hours with the kingdom of God. And the two are not the same. Roger Olson, in his article on the difference between patriotism and nationalism, he had this insight. Patriotism seeks to actualize the highest and the best ideals of one's country, which can sometimes look like disloyalty to nationalists. Nationalists tend to confuse country with government and reject as disloyal all criticism of either. However, criticism of the government can be patriotic. In fact, American patriotism should be constructively critical toward the government. Nationalism is patriotism on steroids. It's patriotism denigrated into jingoism and chauvinism. It's a near idolatry of country and often appears in mixing celebration of nation with worship of God. Patriotism is honest about the country's failures and urges leaders to push on towards better achievements of its founding ideal. Nationalism rejects all criticism of the country as almost, if not exactly, treason. Patriotism regards America as a gift from God and thanks God for it, but equates America with ideals such as freedom of religion, freedom of expression, and equal justice for all. It is 
realistic in knowing that government and society do not always live up to those ideals. When patriots wave the flag, they are fully aware that it symbolizes and represents wonderful ideals and not every decision and action government makes. When nationalists wave the flag, they are using it as an idol to sanctify whatever America does. Class, let's be clear. In the kingdom of God, there is no room for nationalism. While on earth, Jesus rejected Jewish nationalism. If you closely read the New Testament, you see that while Jesus was strongly loyal to and even the embodiment of the covenant Israel of God, he also knew that that is in no way linked to national boundaries or citizenship or even places of worship. Jesus had a conversation with a foreigner, a Samaritan woman. It takes place in John chapter 4. And in it, Jesus specifically pointed beyond her nationalist understanding standing and the nationalist debate going on at the time to something greater. Sir, the woman said, I can see that you're a prophet. Our ancestors, meaning the Samaritans, worship on this mountain. But you Jews claim that the place where we must worship is in Jerusalem. This was an ongoing rift between Samaritans who worship in Samaria and Jews who worshiped in Jerusalem. And so she was asking Jesus to take a side in this nationalist theological debate. Jesus's answer is shocking. Woman, Jesus replied, Believe me, a time is coming when you will worship the Father neither on this mountain nor in Jerusalem. You Samaritans worship what you do not know. We worship what we do know, for salvation is from the Jews. Yet a time is coming, and has now come, when the true worshipers will worship the Father in spirit and in truth. For they are the kind of worshipers the Father seeks. You see, this woman had nationalist concerns and questions. Her question was specifically nationalist. Who's better? Whose side is God on? Jesus responded, Bonds, God's bigger than your nationalist goals. Yes, salvation does come from the Jews, but Jesus never equates with any province or region or state or citizenship. He equates it with those who worship in spirit and in truth. The kingdom of God has no flags. I, Captain America, defend the American flag, but I defend it as a symbol of freedoms and a symbol of acceptance and of welcoming the foreigner, the oppressed, the needy, the widow, the things that are carved on the Statue of Liberty. Those are the things that when I raise this flag, I represent America at its best. That's patriotism, not nationalism, because when America goes against what is right, Captain America will be the first one there opposing it. Those of you that read Civil War, you remember that whole fiasco. No, in the kingdom, there's no place for nationalism, because God's kingdom brings together people of all nations, and that is the true allegiance. In the last book of the Bible, which my colleague, Professor Stephen Strange, explained, oh, Dr. Stephen Strange, I know he's particular about that doctor part. Well, my colleague, colleague, Dr. Strange, talked some of the symbolism in Revelation. Well, there's a passage in Revelation that's the most anti-nationalist passage in all of Scripture, I'd suggest, and we're going to end with that. John has a vision, and God is letting loose all of this judgment on the earth. All of these things are happening. Seals are opening, and each seal that's opened in the scroll brings forth another aspect of God's plan, which looks on the surface to be terrible, but which we know Jesus is guiding and overseeing the process and protecting his people throughout, despite their physical persecution. In chapter 7, during all of this, John says, Then I heard another angel coming up from the east, having the seal of the living God. He called out in a loud voice to the four angels who had been given power to harm the land and the sea, Do not harm the land or the sea or the trees until we put a seal on the foreheads of the servants of our God. Then I heard the number of those who were sealed, 144,000 from all the tribes of Israel. These are the servants of of God. These are the ones who God is going to hold through the tribulation that they are enduring, the persecution that they are enduring, the ones who God has marked out as his special people. And this is a military census, a Hebrew military census, almost taken verbatim from the book of Numbers. That's what we are hearing, a military census. So this is what John hears when he hears let me put a seal on the servants of our God. But then, in the most anti-nationalist passage in all of Scripture, when John turns and looks at this army of Israel, at this 144,000 fighting men from the tribes of Israel, that's what military census lists were. That's what he expects to see when he turns to look. But what he actually sees, I look, and there before me was a great multitude that no one could count from every nation, tribe, people, and language, standing before the throne and before the lamb. They were wearing white robes and holding palm branches in their hands, and they cried out in a loud voice, Salvation belongs to our God who sits on the throne and to the lamb. 
And we find out in these chapters that these, what was depicted audibly as an end time army of Israel, a very nationalistic image. When John looks, what he sees is the exact opposite. He sees that that is just the symbol of everyone from every tribe, every nation, every language who has come out of this persecution, tribulation, suffering because they followed the lamb. You see, nationalism denies the sovereignty of the lamb in order to bolster the aims of Caesar. Nationalism equates the kingdom of God with concerns for particular states or cultures or races or ethnic groups. Nationalism has no place in the kingdom. Jesus bears no flag. He bows to no Lord on this earth. He is King of Kings and Lord of Lords. So can you celebrate your country? Absolutely. Can you be a patriot? Absolutely. But don't ever let that morph into nationalism. Every sin takes a virtue and twists it into a vice. Nationalism is the vice twisted from the virtue of patriotism. So as your professor and as a symbol of this country, let me be clear once and for all, be American is not the same as to be a Christian. And the interests and the goals and the aims of the country of America are not always the interests, goals, and aims of the King of Kings in the kingdom of God. Let's keep the former at bay when necessary and let's uphold the latter because that's where our true citizenship and our true loyalties lay. So long for now. Be sure to subscribe and check out our other superhero seminary courses. Also note the links that will be in the description of this video so you can learn more about the difference between nationalism and patriotism because all of this plays into our view of the world our views of which countries we should stand with, which countries we should oppose, whose side is God on. All of these questions are bound up and get muddled when we refuse to see the difference between patriotism and nationalism, between the lamb and between Caesar.